Okay, hello again, everyone. This is Emily Clark at Quasi. I think that we should go ahead and get started. So welcome to Quasi's Spring Cyber Seminar on the Water Energy Nexus. This series was organized by Bridget Scanlon at the University of Texas at Austin, but unfortunately Bridget couldn't be here today due to a prior commitment. Today we're going to hear from Barbara Beacons, who is a research hydrologist with the USGS Water Mission Area located in Menlo Park, California. She earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in mathematics before remembering that geologists have more fun and earned a PhD in geology at UC Santa Cruz in 1993. Past studies have focused on the modeling of pore fluid overpressures in subduction zones. More recently, she applied these skills as a co-PI on a USGS Powell Center synthesis study on understanding fluid injection-induced seismicity, which she will be discussing today. She also studies the fate and transport of crude oil contaminants in groundwater. These studies are carried out at the USGS long-term study of the oil site at Bemidji, Minnesota, for which she serves as a research coordinator. She's also a fellow of the Geological Society of America and served as a 2004 GSA Hydrogeology Division Birdsall Dreyse Lecturer. So with that, Barbara, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Emily. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, this is only my second webinar, so I hope I do this new way of doing things justice. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you today um, about basically three studies that came out of a USGS Powell Center study. And that is the relationship of wastewater injection to the increase in central and eastern U.S. seismicity. So um, I, I have a, a bunch of co-authors here, and I'll uh, just lay out where they were involved on this next slide. So. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the USGS Powell Center, uh, where we carried out this study from October 2012 to 2014. Um, the Powell Center invites uh, proposals between USGS and academia to carry out synthesis and analysis studies. They have a one; they call for proposals once a year in January. Um, this was our working group on a field trip in uh, outside Fort Collins where the working groups meet. Um, and I'd like to especially acknowledge co-authors for the uh, presentations I'm going to, to be talking about. Shimon Good, Jonathan Gott, Justin Rubenstein, and, and Matt Weingarten, who was a student at University of Colorado who was supported with funds from the Pell Center. And then uh, also Katie Karanen um, at University of Cornell University, who, um, whose idea was really the basis for the second study that I'll be presenting. So um, I'm going to start with the scope of the problem in this talk. And uh, the illustration here is showing tankers pulling up to a wastewater disposal facility and the um, tanker truck operators uh, unloading the waste to the well. So, and then I'll, I'll have one slide on theory, um, and then I'll go straight into the first of two studies, the injection well database study. Um, and then the second study is a study of the cause of this central Oklahoma earthquake swarm. So on the scope of the problem, um, everybody's probably seen this figure already that uh, Bill Ellsworth published in Science in 2013 about the unprecedented increase in central U.S. earthquakes. So time is on the horizontal axis. The cumulative number of earthquakes is on the axis. So what you see um, between 1973 and 2009 is a, is a constant rate of seismicity for the central and eastern U.S., so uh, 24 earthquakes a year. And then suddenly, starting in 2009, you see the rate really begin to jump up, so uh, to 193, and then jumps again to 688 in 2014, and then 
In 2015, Oklahoma had over 900 earthquakes in just Oklahoma alone. So, um, so we have our own hockey stick in this, you know, part of the world, and um, and it's being felt by people. So it isn't dependent on. I mean, down to magnitude three earthquakes are what. It but we have magnitude fours that are being felt by the public who live in these areas. So it's really um, gotten everyone's attention. So one of the really important facts in this graphic that I'm going to show you is a series designed by Andrea Lenos, who is a statistician who deals with earthquake statistics at USGS. And it more than anything else brought home to me that these earthquakes are associated with oil and gas production areas in the central and eastern U.S. So what we're going to do, this is the, the exponential plot that I just showed you, and what I'm going to do, what Andrea did was remove areas of oil and gas production one at a time. So first I'm going to remove the Oklahoma earthquakes. Um, and you see that a lot of that increase is due to this area outlined by the red box in central Oklahoma. But then we remove, we start removing other areas of known earthquakes. So now I've removed the Guy Greenbrier fault in the Fayetteville shale gas play, uh, shown by the red box. And now the uh, Raton Basin, which is a coal bed methane play. Now uh, Cogdale, Texas and now five other places that are known to be um, oil and gas plays with induced earthquakes. And so you see that um, all of the induced seismicity, all of the increased seismicity can be tied to a few oil and gas producing areas in the central and eastern U.S. Part of the Powell Center's effort was to try to incorporate induced seismicity into the 2014 U.S. National Seismic Hazard Model. And this is not easy because the model is based on statistics of earthquakes for the entire time that we've been collecting earthquake data in the U.S., whereas this induced seismicity hazard has just started up and it will have an ending in the future. So um, but they published their preliminary results in April of 2015. Uh, and it identifies 17 areas of induced seismicity in eight states to, and develops preliminary hazard models that account for the uncertainties um, in the increased hazard. So um, what is driving this increased seismicity um, has been there's pretty much of a there's a consensus that it is caused by underground injection of the salt water uh, that's produced with uh, oil and gas. Um, and the underground injection program was begun by the EPA in the 1980s, and they designated six types of waste. Um, the type of waste that um, for oil and gas wells is class, is called class two waste. And um, uh, the Powell Center assembled a database and found 188,000 Class II disposal wells in the central and eastern U.S. Um, those Class II wells, there's actually two types of wells that are called Class II. The first is um, the actual wastewater disposal. So you have waste that's... Um, you have water that's produced with oil and gas. It's pumped to a well and disposed of in a deeper formation. The second type of well is an enhanced oil recovery well. And you have uh, water that's produced, but that water is reinjected into the same producing formation, and it sweeps through and um, helps, to, um, helps the gas and oil migrate to the producing well. So um, in general, the, the statistical results that I'm going to be showing indicate that the saltwater disposal wells are perhaps more of an issue because they involve net injection, whereas the enhanced oil recovery 
the injected water is pumped out again, so po quite possibly no net injection. Okay, so um, the injection well database was assembled as part of the Pell Center study, um, state by state, from publicly available sources um, by Matt Weingarten and Jonathan Gott. And of the 188,000 wells that were um, in the state databases, and the reason why they're in state databases is because regulation of injection activity is de delegated by the EPA to the states. And one of the requirements is that they keep a database of injection activities. So of those 188,000, 106,000 are active today. And of those, um, only about a quarter are saltwater disposal, and the remainder are enhanced oil recovery wells. Um, and those are shown. They're distributed over the same areas, but you can see them on the maps in the lower part of the screen. So why is the injection causing problems? Well, to understand that, you have to understand um, Coulomb stress. And so up here, and this is Coulomb stress theory according to a geologist where beer can is always handy. And what we have here is S is the Coulomb stress. So the, um, and S is given by the shear stress tau on the fault minus the frictional stress. So the shear stress is what's tending to cause the fault to fail. The frictional stress is what keeps the fault from failing. The frictional stress is given by the product of the um, friction coefficient mu times um, what's called the effective stress in parentheses. The effective stress is the normal stress given by sigma on the fault minus the pore pressure given by P. And so to actually have the fault fail, you have to have a change in the Coulomb stress. And what um, in the crust is at equilibrium until you change something. And you're not changing the shear stress. You're not changing the normal stress because that's governed by the weight of the rocks overhead. The only thing that you're changing in, um, in these induced earthquakes is the pore pressure. And so to do the um, Hubbard and Ruby beer can experiment, you start with an unchilled open beer can, and you put it upside down, and you observe on a sheet of glass, a wet sheet of glass, and you observe that it doesn't start sliding until you raise the glass to 27 degrees. And this, um, in 1959, these are probably steel beer cans. Ours are aluminum now, so um, do your own experiment and tell me what happens. Uh, so um, then you take the beer can and you put it in the freezer and you let it get good and cold and then you take it out and you put it upside down again on the wet glass. Make sure the edges are sealed around with water and then you wait till the beer can warms up. And what happens as the beer can warms up, the air in the can expands and increases the pressure. And so that increased pressure decreases the normal force, um, which causes the can to slide. And um, oftentimes you hear people say the fault was lubricated by the water, but Lubrication changes the coefficient of friction mu. But in our case, the coefficient of friction is the coefficient of the rocks on each other. What's actually changing is the pore pressure. So lubrication isn't quite the right term as air hockey. You know, we turned on the air hockey table. Um, so that is the principle behind um, a change in the uh, Coulomb stress. So we knew this in 1980. Um, already there were a couple of seminal papers. We have a paper by Paul Shea and John Bredehoff modeling the Denver earthquakes. Denver had a series of earthquakes 
uh, one of them over magnitude 5 that did, were damaging. They were um, attributed, they were, it was eventually realized that it was injection into um, a fault zone of waste at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Um, it was in, directly into crystalline basement in a fracture zone. Um, and uh, Shea and Breda Hoft had a modeling study that basically they were able to show that the seismicity started when a pore pressure front of 3.2 megapascal um, arrived at the location of the earthquakes. Uh, so that was the critical pore pressure threshold in that study. Um, a second study uh, that actually preceded it, um, Jack Healy and colleagues, including John Bredehoft, um, actually did a controlled experiment at an oil field in Rangeley, Colorado. Uh, they'd heard that there were earthquakes being caused by this oil field activity. They were doing enhanced oil recovery. And they got permission from the oil field operator to do some test injections. It was a sandstone aquifer. They were injecting 1,000 meters above basement. And they found that the critical pore pressure was uh, 27 and a half megapascal. So um, an order of magnitude. So these studies were on single faults. Um, but that's what our background was on this problem before this recent uh, issue. But um, more recently, um, observations have began to um, reveal that much lower stresses are required to trigger earthquakes on stressed faults. Um, and one of the most influential ones was a study by Ross Stein published in Nature in 1999. And um, the figure that we're looking at here is um, a, pi a picture of the San Gregorio Fault along its length. So we're looking at the plane of the fault. The San Gregorio Fault is very near the San Andreas in the area where the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred in 1989. And um, the dots are earthquakes before Loma Prieta are blue, and earthquakes after Loma Prieta are red. And so what you see immediately is that there were more earthquakes after Loma Prieta. So Loma Prieta triggered earthquakes along this fault. And then contoured on the picture is the um, modeled stress increase along the San Gregorio Fault as a result of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And what you see is in the area of the increased earthquakes, the stress increase was only 0.5 bar, which is equivalent to 0 0.05 megapascal. So contrast that to the previous studies where you needed a stress of 27 and a half megapascal or 3.2 megapascal. So we're down to much lower levels of stress. And there was an influential paper uh, by Townend and Zoback um, where they cataloged, they compiled the state of the stress uh, that had been measured at um, study sites uh, in the deep subsurface. Um, and this is their compiled plot where the vertical axis is the mean stress. So think of that as the normal stress on the fault. And the horizontal axis is the differential stress. Think of that as the shear stress on the fault. And the dots line up along, um, and the ratio of the two is the friction, co uh, let's see, the ratio of the two is 0.6. The ratio of the two, um, but 0.6 is the average friction coefficient for rocks in the Earth's crust. So what it's telling you is that the ratio of the normal stress to the deviatoric stress, the, the shear stress, is equal to what we expect to be the coefficient of friction, which means that that stresses are in equilibrium, exact equilibrium with each other for uh, the average coefficient of friction. So that means that these faults are just poised for failure. Um, and that's what we call critically stressed. So um, 
the USGS uh, website, and it just says uh, all the things you need to induce an earthquake. You need um, you need to have injection. It includes depends on the injection rate and total volume injected. So we're going to discuss that um, next. Depends on the presence of faults that are large enough to produce felt earthquakes. Well, if you ask a seismologist where the faults are, they'll say, well, tell me where the earthquakes are. So the faults are, there are lots of faults um, that we don't know about, as we know in California. Stresses that are large enough to produce earthquakes. Um, so we've found that um, you need a very small stress change to, um, to trigger earthquakes on a fault. And then the presence of pathways for fluid pressure to travel from injection points to faults, and I'll be talking about that. And um, one of the things about this issue is that it's regulated by the state. And so each state has been responding um, to the problem in their state with their own hypotheses about what caused the problem. So Ohio identified that the um, Youngstown earthquake was caused by injection into a fault, um, and the well was also open into basement. And so they required plugging back wells uh, to the sediment basement interface and require full geophysical logs to demonstrate that the injection well is not located in a fault or fracture zone. Oklahoma um, also, uh, reg regulators have requested that wells that are penetrating basement be plugged back to the sediment basement interface and that injection volumes be reduced. And Kansas has also ordered a volume cut. So let's see how those um, principles that uh, proximity to basement, proximity uh, depth of the well, volume reduction, let's see that, how that relates to a study of um, a database. So the parameters hypothesized to affect seismicity, um, as we saw on the previous slide, cumulative volume, injection rate, injection pressure. Uh, pressure is already regulated. It can't be more than a fraction of lithostatic injection depth um, and proximity to basement. So we investigated those with a database study. And the approach was uh, to compile a database of injection wells for the central and eastern US and find the injection wells associated with earthquakes using spatial and temporal criteria. So the way the criteria were designed were um, previously there was a, there is a rule of thumb that um, an earthquake would be suspected as induced if there was an injection well within five kilometers. So we used that criterion about whether wells were associated with earthquakes. But it's also important to know that the error in earthquake locations in the national uh, seismic array is 10 kilometers. Um, so we added that uncertainty to the five kilometers to say anything within 15, any well within 15 kilometers of the epicenter of an earthquake is so-called associated injection well. And then also the well had to be operating at the time of the earthquake, so it had to be active. Um, and I'd just like to make a quick point about this 10 kilometer uncertainty. That uncertainty is the reason why they, uh, there was always a call for deploying a temporary seismic network around an area of suspected induced seismicity or a greater density of coverage for Oklahoma because it's you cannot relate uh, an earthquakes to wells without good earthquake locations if you only know a 10 kilometer uncertainty in the location. So you saw this slide already. This was the compiled injection well database. And of those wells, um, about a quarter were saltwater disposal wells. So those are the ones that made perhaps of most concern. And uh, when the association criteria, that 15 kilometer radius plus active, um, was applied, 18,000 of the wells, or 10% of all the wells were um, associated. And of those wells, 14,000 are active today. 
So the associated wells are shown in yellow. Um, and you can see that down here that um, they're not evenly distributed. There are many more associated wells in Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas than in other states. Um, this exercise may seem, um, it, it sort of may defy belief that it can be useful, but I'd like to point out that it actually does result in highlighting the areas of induced earthquakes that are known at this time. So for example, the uh, Fayetteville, the Guy Greenbrier Fault in Arkansas, the Raton Basin on the Colorado-Utah border, uh, the Northern Ohio, uh, Youngstown and Ashtabula, and then uh, the earthquakes in Oklahoma and the known induced areas in Texas all show up. So then we took these associated wells and we analyzed their properties. Um, and so this is the first um, of those analyses. So there are two plots here. The plot on the top right, um, what's plotted on the horizontal axis is injection rate in barrels per month. The vertical axis is a histogram of number of wells. The blue is all the saltwater disposal wells. And the yellow are the associated saltwater disposal wells, so the ones that were associated with earthquakes. And if there was um, no difference, no. so the bottom plot is uh, the percent of associated wells in each histogram bin. And so for what you see, going along all of the, um, all the injection rates, there's a constant number of associated wells for each injection rate up until you get over 300,000 barrels a month. And then you see a higher percentage of associated wells. So this is telling us that above 300,000 barrels a month, there are a higher percentage of wells associated with earthquakes than you expect. And then we also examined cumulative volume. So again, the same histogram at the top with uh, all wells and associated wells and the same percentage plot at the bottom. And you don't see that uh, statistically significant increase in associated wells for the highest cumulative volume in the database. And, and so we also uh, tested for injection depth and proximity to basement and injection pressure and f did not find significant relations for any of those parameters. So the only parameter we found a significant relationship for was injection rate. And now um, I'd like to use a case study to illustrate um, the effect of injection rate. Um, there were a series of earthquakes uh, called the Jones Swarm between 2009 and 2012. Jones is a suburb of Oklahoma City um, located in the center of the index map. And um, what I, what's interesting about the Jones Swarm is um, it started off, it was basically the start of the increased earthquake activity in Oklahoma. So starting in two, so the index plot marked figure A down in the corner, you see, you see California seismicity in blue and Oklahoma seismicity in red, and you see Oklahoma seismicity ramping up starting in 2009. And then this other small insert plot here, the Jones earthquakes are brown, in brown and the central Oklahoma earthquakes in red. You can see that the Jones earthquake were a huge contributor to the increase in central Oklahoma seismicity during that time. Um, and here the earthquakes are plotted um, on the map and also plotted are injection wells. Um, and they are keyed by size of the square as larger volume. So you can't quite see them. I'll show better plots where you can see the injection wells better. But the important thing about this plot is that the center of the swarm here in Jones, the nearest injection wells are 15 kilometers, 
15 to 20 kilometers to the southwest over here and 40 kilometers to the northeast over here. So it was a great mystery. How could this earthquake swarm be due to injection activity when the nearest wells were so far away? So Katie Kiernan um, investigated these earthquakes with, um, with a local seismic network. So she had really good locations on these earthquakes with a local seismic network. And she made the following observations. One is that the, um, the swarm started uh, down here. This is uh, the color coding. These are earthquake epicenters color coded by days since January 1st, 2010. They started down here, and then they moved over time up to the um, northeast. Um, they were also, some of them were located in the uh, Arbuckle formation above basement, and then others were located in the basement. So this is depth versus number of earthquakes. So she had a hypothesis that these southwest disposal wells were um, what was uh, contributing the pressure that triggered the earthquakes. Um, and I'd also like to point out, uh, so this is a better plot. Here are the southeast disposal wells um, down here. And here are the disposal wells up in the uh, northeast. Sorry, these are southwest. It's the southeast side of Oklahoma City um, where the wells are located. Uh, and these inserts down here, insert um, A up here, uh, you can see the earthquakes lining up along a fault structure. And also in insert B, you can see the earthquakes lining up along a fault structure. So. Um, Multiple faults are implicated in this earthquake swarm. Here you can see them lining up along a fault structure very clearly. So um, unlike the 1980 and 1970 studies that studied individual faults, we have multiple faults that may, uh, some may be more optimally oriented and trigger at lower um, increased stresses. So the other thing that Katie noted, um, and this is a complicated plot, but um, here's when the injection started um, in this area in, 20, in 2006. You didn't actually see um, the cumulative earthquake shown in green um, really take off until 2009. And she felt that it was significant that Zero wellhead pressure, which is shown in blue, were reported at those fire high rate wells before 2009. And then they started requiring positive pressure at the wellhead for the injection. Um, and then the red is a, um, the cumulative injection rate. So the cumulative injection rate was rising um, prior to the time that the um, seismic moment Release. So the moment release is basically the sum of all the energy released by all the earthquakes in the Jones swarm. So Katie's hypothesis was that there was a poor pressure uh, perturbation that was triggering the swarm that it originated at these wells to the southwest. And she wanted a hydrologic model to determine what was the poor pressure change from these wells at the location of the earthquakes. Um, were, was that change reasonable to trigger earthquakes? And what uh, was the pressure contribution of these wells up here to the northeast? So on this plot, the red diamonds are production wells. The white squares are disposal wells. The black dots are the earthquakes. Um, and so here are those four high rate disposal wells down uh, in this area and the associated production wells shown in red. So those four disposal wells, um, this is the injection volume. Uh, injection volumes are only required to be reported. Um, they're not required to be reported daily. They're reported monthly. Um, but these are the monthly volumes of the, the four wells shown in the light. Uh, and then the sum of the four wells shown is the dark curve. Um, and you can see that the sum of those four wells, which are on pads within a couple kilometers of each other is greater than uh, 
is between four and five million barrels a month. And previous uh, induced seismicity uh, studies had implicated injection wells of about two to 300,000 barrels a month. So on these four co-located wells, we're way above previous implications of induced seismicity. So why is there so much water being produced in Oklahoma? So I'm just going to digress. Uh, Dewatering is a technique that um, was developed in the last, uh, the last decade or so. Prior to um, this recent period, if there was too much water coming out of an oil production well, the operators gave up. They said this is not economic, um, and they didn't bother to develop um, the oil from that formation. But since then, it's been realized that if you just keep pumping the water, eventually oil starts to come out. And you can produce economic quantities of oil with lots of water. So sometimes it's called a high water cut if you just um, have a cheap way of disposing of that water. So in dewatering, um, the water is first pumped out. And then when the water pressure is lowered, then the oil starts to come out of the tighter porosity is what this figure is illustrating. Initially, water oil ratios can be as high as 1,000 to 1. Eventually, they level off um, in the Hunton at an average of 30 to 1. So 30 barrels of, oil, of water for each barrel of oil. In the Arbuckle, it's more like 40 to 1 for average for Oklahoma. Contrast that to the national average for produced water from oil and gas is a, a ratio of 5 to 1. So um, there's a lot of water being disposed of uh, with this technique called dewatering. And here's just a schematic of it. Um, they're pumping out of the Hunton, in this case, the Hunton formation. They have some um, horizontal wells. Uh, then the oil and water go into a separator. And then they re-inject the water into a different formation. In this case, it's the Arbuckle which is uh, just above the basement, crystalline basement. So, um, and the reason why this is economic is also given on the same website that I accessed um, the other day. The red circle represents the originally developed area of the Hunton before dewatering was recognized as a strategy. The blue circle represents what is economically being recovered with the dewatering strategy. And uh, contrast the original um, 158,000 barrels of oil in the original area to um, 1.7 million barrels of oil in the expanded area producible using dewatering. And, but these dewatering plays, um, if you look, this is a rank of wells according to the injection rate um, for uh, Oklahoma. And what you see, the four wells that were um, part of Katie's hypothesis, the four high rate wells, Chambers, Flower Power, uh, Chambers, Flower Power, Deep Throat, and Sweetheart um, are among the top injectors in Oklahoma. And the colored wells are all dewatering plays. So 150 um, of the active disposal wells in Oklahoma contribute 20% of the total uh, disposed of volume. So the area that we studied um, the production is out of the Arbuckle Formation on the west side of the Nemaha Fault. And the disposal is into the down-dropped Arbuckle Formation on the east side of the Nemaha Fault, which is 700 meters deeper uh, because of the offset. And notice that the Arbuckle juxtaposes a granitic basement. So um, we modeled this as a no-flow boundary here in the model. Um, and the Arbuckle is part of the Great Carbonate Bank, which covers uh, the central US. So it is a very contiguous formation. 
there was uh, a comprehensive study of the Arbuckle conducted by the Kansas Geological Survey uh, that was written up by Francine in this, uh, in this AAPG memoir. And um, they, conduct, they collected a huge amount of data in order to determine the feasibility of geologic carbon sequestration. So they uh, included cores, geophysical logs, uh, in situ permeability tests, and core permeability tests. And they found that the lower Arbuckle was the most permeable part of the Arbuckle, so the part just above basement, and that permeabilities were over uh, 1,000 millidarcies, or um, 10 to the minus 12 meters squared. And that permeability is not associated with karst, because the upper part of the Arbuckle was karstified. But the lower part, this is original porosity associated with those uh, reef deposits. Um, so it's, there's a potential for it to be quite extensive, uh, extensively connected. And here is their uh, inference of permeability based on their geophysical logs and their cores and their in situ tests. Uh, this is uh, depth in feet on the vertical axis. The highest permeable area is the base of the R buckle, and permeabilities were above uh, up to 1,500 millidarcies, which uh, millidarcy, 1,000 millidarcies is equivalent to 10 to the minus 12 meters squared, or if we were at um, 20 degrees C, 10 to the minus 5th meters per second hydraulic conductivity. So that allowed us, that uh, gave us a sense that the R buckle is quite permeable, and the operators know that because it's accepting an enormous amount of water in these disposal wells. Um, so the hydrologic model was um, a semi-infinite half space. It was uh, a no-flow boundary along the Nemaha Fault. Um, it extended 200 kilometers along strike, 130 meter kilometers going away from the fault. Uh, it, had, uh, it was six kilometers total in height. Uh, the Simpson, Arbuckle, Regan group, which were the permeable sediments, uh, were one about a kilometer thick and were assigned a diffusivity of two meters squared per second. Basement was in, assigned a decreasing permeability according to the Ingebrigtsen and Manning decrease with depth. Um, and then the injection wells were actually driven with the recorded injection volumes. Um, so we had the four wells here. We also included the wells to the uh, northeast. So here are the model results in plan view. Um, these are the four large injection wells that are in this area. And then these are the, all the other injectors that were included in the model up in this area. The earthquakes are the black dots. And, and what these are the earthquakes that had occurred by December 2009. What you see is that the pore pressure front um, of 0.1 megapascal had arrived at the um, location of the 2009 onset of the swarm by 2009. And by 2012, the 0.1 megapascal front had moved out. Um, and what you can also notice uh, to encompass the swarm in 2012, the, um, these smaller uh, injection wells don't have as much of an influence as these high volume injectors. Um, and I'm going to show you a cross section here along AA prime. So uh, this is where the earthquakes were located according to the seismicity data. And uh, this is the pore pressure results in cross section. And you can see that the pore pressure does propagate down a kilometer into basement um, equivalent. So you, you can trigger earthquakes in the basement with uh, this injection model scenario. And then the last point that I'd like to make is that um, this is a cumulative volume of the low rate wells shown in yellow and the high rate wells uh, shown in red. So there is a much larger cumulative injection volume from the low rate wells. But then if you look at the model pore pressure influence from the wells, the uh, low rate wells only contribute 15% of the pressure increase at the center of the swarm compared to the high rate wells uh, in contributing 85%.
and then the combined influence is shown in blue. Um, so this study supports the idea that injection rate is a, a, an issue. And then lastly, um, this is a plot of the modeled pore pressure change on the horizontal axis um, at each earthquake. Um, and so you see the histogram of the earthquakes in the swarm and what the model showed the pore pressure change was at the time of the earthquake. And you can see that the majority of the swarm begins at a critical pore pressure of 0 0.07 megapascal. So much lower than the 3.2 or 27.5 megapascal from the 80s results, but in line with the newer study of Rothstein and others, a very low potential for triggering in a critically stressed crust. So in summary, um, I have um, presented that graphic sequence by Andrea Lenos to illustrate that the entire increase in the recent uh, mid-continent seismicity is associated with oil and gas production. Um, and then I presented the database study that implicated the highest injection rates as increasing the likelihood of earthquake association and did not implicate cumulative volume or depth of injection or proximity to basement or injection pressure. Um, and lastly, what we have found with the Jones, Oklahoma swarm is that much larger distances and lower pore pressures than observed in the 1980 studies appear to be associated with these earthquakes. Thank you very much. Um, and I believe there's time for questions. Hi, Barbara. Thank Hi. you for your presentation. So at this time, we'll go ahead and open up the floor to anyone that has questions. You can go ahead and type a question into the chat box, and we will, um, well, Barbara will answer it for you. Just wait a few minutes while people are typing. So while the questions are coming in, I'll just call your attention to the schedule for the upcoming webinars. Next week, we will hear from Mark Engel and Bridget Scanlon, uh, again, at 3 o'clock Eastern time. And they will talk about water in the oil and gas cycle, including hydraulic fracturing. And then on April 1st, we'll hear from Bridget Scanlon and Vince Tidwell regarding water and electricity generation, including the sources of water for energy production. So those, again, are at 3 p.m. Eastern time the next two Fridays. All right, so there's a question that has come in from Felipe Hernandez. And he says, so high injection rate was the only statistically significant individual effect. Could interactions between factors also be important? Um, so, so yes, I think that um, one of the interesting things is this, is about the study is that we could not rule out completely proximity to basement, and I think it's well recognized uh, with this, with the modeling study that um, most of the earthquakes are in basement, and that's actually one of the open questions: is that how is it possible that you're triggering earthquakes in basement by injection above basement? So I think that certainly uh, proximity to basement is one of the factors that is interacting with the injection rate. Um, OK, and there's yeah. a question from Megan. Right, so is there any, why the 1980 studies required much larger changes in pore pressure than the most recent study? Um, so my thought is that the 1980 studies were on individual faults. Um, and they may not have been optimally oriented toward, for failure. Whereas when you are 
um, conducting such a high, um, you know, this, this experiment that is being conducted in Oklahoma where there are large volumes being injected over a very large area, um, you have the opportunity in this experiment to encounter all the faults that are in that area. And some of them uh, are, could be poised for failure in this critically stressed crust. Um, so that's my feeling for why we're seeing lower values. Thank you, Steve. Okay, hey, any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Um, is there any similar study linking groundwater withdrawal for water supply use and earthquakes? Um, you know, that's a really good question. There are studies linking um, oil and gas withdrawal to earthquakes. Um, I have not seen any studies linking groundwater for drinking water. Um, I do think that the depth of the withdrawal is important, and the, um, the, the studies implicating oil and gas withdrawal are, show that it's a, the poroelastic effect. So it's not the pore pressure, it's the change in the state of stress caused by um, the change in the pore pressure over the region. So um, in theory, you can get groundwater um, effects and induced earthquakes. They've been shown um, in the uh, Sierra Nevada, the snowpack. Um, they've been shown in the areas of um, hydrothermal, geothermal areas. Um, so the weight of the water um, is known to change the uh, effective stress. But, the, but actual water supply withdrawal, I have not heard any studies like that. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I think that we can end for the day. So Barbara, again, I want to say thank you so much for being here today and presenting this series and providing an excellent presentation for us. And we will go ahead and post the recording of this presentation on the Quasi website um, for others to view. And we okay, hope thanks. to see you next week uh, during the next Cyber Seminar presentation. So happy Friday, everyone. Have a great day. And Barbara, thanks again. Sure. Bye.